Okay, uh, great. Well, let's get started. Uh, so this is the third lecture on the metaphysics of the laws of nature. Um, let's just um, get into it by first uh, reviewing what we've done. The first lecture, we looked at the history of the laws of nature concept. We would have started with Aristotle. In time before we had the laws of nature concept, he had some causal powers, which were doing the sort of causal work in his worldview. Then we had a, a sharp transition away from that to a sort of a Cartesian view in the early modern period. And this is a very top-down governing view. What we're going to talk about now is a move back towards Aristotle. Some people in uh, contemporary philosophy want to move us back towards an Aristotelian view, even though it was very historically important that we got away from it at a certain point. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about Hume. I'll get to Hume a little bit at the end of today. OK. so. As I discussed in lecture one, we got this law of nature concept when we moved away from Aristotelian powers in a sort of scholastic system to a Cartesian view that had the uh, God giving the powers from on high. Um, now, some contemporary thinkers want to go back to Aristotle. And this is a phrase which is repeated sometimes throughout their text. We need to go back to Aristotle in some way. Um, but in some of these texts, we want to hold on to a revised version of this law of nature concept. So Aristotle didn't have this laws of nature concept in the same way we have it today. There was great progress made on that front with Descartes. Now we want to go back to Aristotle, but keeping the laws of nature concept. We'll talk about that sort of approach later. But others, which we'll talk about first, think that once we've rejected this sort of top-down governing view that comes from uh, Descartes, that we don't really need the laws of nature anymore. That's a sort of historical accident that we went in that direction with Descartes' um, not a historical accident, but uh, uh, the concept, here's Van Frossen saying, the concept of a law of nature is an anachronism. Its proper life begins, belongs to the 17th and 18th century. So once we've gone away from governing laws, do we really need to call them laws? Do we need that laws concept? Is it doing us any good? Is it doing us harm? So here are three stances which Stephen Mumford uh, outlines about how you could feel about the existence of laws of nature, um, you could think in a primitivist way, as we saw with Maudlin, that laws are a distinct, irreducible, non-empty category of things in the world. So there are laws of nature. We don't reduce them or explain them in terms of anything else. Uh, and they do their work in the world in a sort of governing way. And Maudlin thought something like this. Other views, uh, of which there are a lot, uh, we have a reductionism. There are laws, uh, but they can be accounted for entirely in terms of things that are not laws. We explain the laws away in terms of Armstrong's end relations. We don't exactly explain them away, but we explain what they are. Um, or we have laws which supervene on causal powers or human regularities. Right? So we want to continue with this laws of nature concept, but to explain it in terms of other things. And that could be governing, and that could be causal powers, or it could be humanism. But the third position, which we should talk about, is eliminativism. Humphrey says, uh, laws are neither reducible to categories, to other categories, nor are they a distinct category in their own right. There are really just causal powers or human regularities. Nothing's doing the governing work, and so nothing deserves the word laws of nature. And he thinks in particular that the law of nature talk is unhelpful and even hurtful. It's distracting and gives us wrong intuitions all the time, and we'd be better off without the concept. Well, let's read some of what Mumford says about this um, claim of eliminativism, a hard word to say. Um, it's a strong claim. The reason I conclude in its favor is that there are models of successful elimination, and I think the concept of law has enough in common with such cases. The concept of a witch has been near enough eliminated from Western society, for instance, why was the concept eliminated rather than merely revised or reduced to something more acceptable and scientific? One reason might be that the concept contained a central connotation that was harmful or misleading, such as being in command of magical forces and using them for evil ends. We don't think that there's magic or supernatural evil. Uh, revision of the concept would not be possible because any such revision must involve losing the concept's central connotation. Okay. So he's saying something analogous about the laws of nature in this paper. Uh, which is the one from 2005. <coughs> I'll give references at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so there's this central connotation of laws 
sort of has something to do with governing. And if we lose that, we really lose any use for the laws at all, says Mumford. What's the central connotation? There's more quotes from Mumford. There's something unacceptable about the conceptual core of the notion of a law in nature. It suggests that the world's properties are governed externally, as we saw last time. That laws are embodied within the properties of the world is a more acceptable metaphysic, I think. But it forgoes the central connotation of the laws of nature as it's used throughout the modern and contemporary philosophy. That's my emphasis. Um, in attempting to embody laws within properties, the idea of governance seems to vanish. The laws aren't really governing things, they're not really laws, because that's a central part of what it means to be a law. But this idea of how the concept is employed throughout the modern and contemporary philosophy, I'm not so sure it's so tied to governing. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but that's something we should be dubious about. Um, here's more Mumford uh, summarizing Cartwright. Mumford says, uh, top-down views of laws, governing views, see the world as still containing no modal properties. By modal properties, he basically means causal powers, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and therefore, needing the imposition of laws to make the world active and dynamic. Our world self-evidently is active and dynamic. Are the laws the best explanation for the source of this dynamism? If we accept what's to be called, broadly, modal properties, we see that the laws were never needed to begin with. The only reason Descartes moved towards laws of nature was because he had a completely passive and inert view of matter. He has a mind-body distinction. Bodies are bodies. They have no minds. They have no knowledge, no intentions, no co capability to act, no capability to follow orders if they were given orders. Um, so really it has to be some sentient mind thing, which is God doing all the moving. Thing. But if the modal properties are already there, then we don't need these laws to be introduced. So it gets rid of the whole impetus for introducing them. Arguably, the reason why Aristotle and others prior to Descartes got by without them, uh, the laws meaning, uh, was that their world was already an active world that required, required no further animation from outside. Okay. So we, if we're really reintroducing causal powers, we completely undercut the reason for introducing laws of nature in the first place, and therefore don't need to think about laws. Um, last quote from Mumford, and recall from lecture two, we saw a problem with the governing view. If the laws of nature are contingent across worlds, if matter could have been governed differently, uh, then what makes it nomically necessary within a given world? Where does the necessitation come from if the laws themselves are contingent across worlds? And Mumford thinks that's an important part of laws is that they're contingent across worlds, as we'll see here. We might further think that this problem, the, the one I just described, um, is dissolved because Ellis is, who we'll talk about later, has a causal powers view, uh, gives up entirely the contingency of laws by making the laws follow necessarily from the natures of bodies. But the laws were supposed to be things that determined or regulated the behavior of inert and otherwise unconnected events that could have been different. They could have determined different behaviors for the same particulars. If the material bodies are completely inertive and passive, they need to be told what to do. And ostensibly, they could be told what to do in several different ways. If God decided to tell them to behave this way, they'd do that. They'd do something else if told to do something else. So it's really the law is making the determination, and it could have been otherwise, about what's going on. They could have determined different behaviors for the very same particulars. Uh, discovery of the laws would then tell us which of the many possibilities was actually the way in which the behavior of particles was regulated. If we give up the contingency of laws, then we seem to give up their very reason for being, as being this extra deciding factor which tells the inert stuff what to do. Um, so uh, concepts can be revised in light of better understanding, but they can also be given up on the grounds of having no useful purpose. Okay, so, um, well, let's just stop for a moment and, and maybe I'll take some comments from you guys. How do you guys feel about this? Do we need the laws of nature if we're not going to have them governing? Does it completely undercut the reason for their existence? Any, any thoughts? The laws of nature seem like an important concept. You like, think about it all the time. There's a sort of historical baggage coming from this sort of governing view, which maybe we don't believe in any longer. Does that undercut the term, or could the term be rehabilitated in some way? That's what we're going to try and wonder about in the next few slides. Um, so we may want to reassess the role of law that we have uh, 
for playing inside. If we aren't accepting laws as primitive, like Madeline says, or giving them any sort of top-down governance work to do in a sort of end relations Armstrong style, then what's the point of continuing the laws of nature concept, laws of nature talk? Um, that's the question Mumford and also uh, Van Frossen somewhat are raising. Um, but recall, yeah, from lecture two, the laws play a lot of important axiom-like roles in scientific <coughs> thinking. They're the basic principles from which we derive everything else. And maybe they don't have a sort of counterpart out there in the world that's doing the governing in the same way they sort of govern and control it or the foundation for our thought. Um, but the laws and their consequences uh, shape our thinking about possibilities and counterfactuals and how we make our explanations and structure them. And that all seems very important. Um, and appealing to laws somehow makes that seem uh, like good practice. Um, Daniel, can I, can I ask a yeah. question? Go ahead. Hi, hi, everybody. I'm sorry, I can't see who's there, but I'll speak anyway. Um, so my question is whether um, this talk about governing is not a uh, kind of a distraction. Because uh, first of all, um, if we take like paradigmatic uh, examples of, of laws of nature or, or alleged laws of nature, for yeah. instance, Newton's law of inertia, uh, it actually doesn't say anything about governance. It's saying, it, it, uh, on the contrary, it says that uh, matter will simply kind of mind its own business without any uh, external interaction. So, uh, yeah. so I, I, I'm not, I, I can't really see how the law of inertia governs kind of thing. Also, um, it seems to me that um, this talk about causal powers is merely uh, governing in disguise. I mean, I don't see why it matters whether the laws uh, tells uh, uh, matter, uh, tells, let's say, the causal power within matter how to behave or whether the law do the governing themselves. I'm not sure if this is uh, more than a difference in the world, a difference that doesn't make any difference. A difference in words. Um, yeah. Well, I do agree that it's the reading of Descartes uh, or Newton's law of inertia on which it's just describing that what particles do when left to their own. Uh, but Descartes introduced it specifically in his philosophy as a sort of rules coming from God to, uh, to govern the world. Um, so that the distinction between the governing view and the causal powers view is really whether or not there are these things called causal powers. Descartes really thought there weren't, and that um, matter was just passive and inert, and how could a rock decide or know or take action to do anything? It's just a rock, just stuff, you know? And so you need a mind to come in. So there's real uh, metaphysical differences about where the, what, what the nature of bodies, physical bodies are. Um, and so I think there is really a significant dis philosophical disagreement here. Um, and, and maybe we can both use the terminology governing, which is um, something I'm going to try and justify a little bit in, in a moment, um, whether or not this uh, governing terminology or law-based metaphor uh, is exclusively associated with the governing view, or if it can also be adapted for the causal powers view. So if, if I may, a, a quick follow-up. Yeah. Uh, maybe if you can, uh, I don't know if now, but maybe later, sharpen a bit the distinction because um, let's say if, if, if we take a concrete example of, uh, say, electrons. Yeah. And uh, let's say the causal power view will say that electrons have the causal power to uh, attract positive charges and, and yeah. uh, dif uh, diffract negative charges. Uh, and the governing law view will say that it is a law that uh, negative charges uh, repulse one another and, and, and positive charges uh, yeah. uh, attract one another. So uh, the thing is that uh, for me, these uh, two claims sound almost well, entirely equivalent. The, the second claim isn't that it's, they're not adding on the fact that it's a law that. Both, both views are accounting for these as laws and making the lawhood claim like, as a property of a certain uh, a, a sentence being a law-like sentence. So both are agreeing about the law talk. It's just where the impetus of the causal power comes from, if it's from the nature of bodies themselves or from an external source. But we'll, we'll see. We'll get back to the electron example later because the second half of the talk is all about what the causal powers are, how they're a little bit mysterious, how they might work. So we'll, we'll get onto that distinction more 
um, later. Okay. Um, so we have the laws playing a very important role in scientific practice. And last time we talked about how we might approach the relationship between metaphysics and scientific practice. We could either try and justify the roles of laws, like we look at the role of law in scientific practice, and then try and do metaphysics with an aim to justify that. And the second strategy would be to question the laws. But if we're going to go down this justify the role of law uh, pattern, we first need the metaphysical story about what the laws are. Right? We do need that in place first. Um, and that could be anything from causal powers to humanism to a governing view. We need some account. Uh, and then we need to show how that account accounts for the, the success of scientific law talk, right? Because scientists are very successfully employing law talk to sort of structure their discourses. And so how are we, how are we going to explain that? And when, when we're in the mode of justifying the role of law, we further endorse the spirit of that speech. The scientists are using their laws in their ways. And we say, we have a metaphysics to back up the spirit of the way you're talking about things. Go scientists, keep up the good work. The second strategy um, we had, which was questioning the role of laws, we again need a metaphysical story about laws, but now maybe we could say there are no laws. That's the metaphysical story we give. Um, but then we still need to account for the success of scientific law talk. The scientists are using laws and they're getting away with it and uh, we need to account for how they've done this. This would now be an error theory. You still have to explain what the scientists are doing with the things they're calling laws. And you say, really, there are no things such as laws. I reject the spirit of the sort of scientific discourse around laws, uh, bad, bad scientists, but I've accounted for your success anyway. So in either way, you need to look at how scientists are using the term and account for it, whether or not you endorse it or not. Right? I think that's only the difference between this um, eliminativist and reductionist uh, strategies. Okay. But now let's see if we can find an alternate justification for that legal metaphor we're talking about. So I mentioned in, in lecture one that we don't have to think about laws as being imposed as above if by a god or king in the way that Descartes thought they were. Um, we can instead go for uh, Ott's reading, at least, of Bacon and Spinoza, who were uh, contemporaries of Descartes on either side. This is Francis Bacon, um, who, he says, point to a different facet of the legal analogy the sense in which laws describe what must happen in a variety of different circumstances. There's no laws of nature to court. There are laws of individual natures. Maybe this is what the meat is, is latching on to. And the laws state that the contributions that those natures make to the events in which they figure. Uh, to fully grasp the nature of heat, a nature like heat, is to learn all of the conditionals that are true by virtue of its powers. And to uh, know the natures of those that it can encounter. So how all the natures of individual bodies work and how they work in combinations. And we have laws for each of those things, and maybe other laws for putting those natures together. That's a very different kind of uh, legal metaphor that Descartes has in mind. And so Bacon and Spinoza declined the 17th century's invitation to move beyond powers, to reject that bodies have powers, uh, but they want to keep the powers, but they want to locate the powers within a metaphorical space of laws. So they get swept up in the law talk along with everybody else, but they don't accept the central premise of governing laws. They want laws that sort of describe the powers of bodies. Maybe in a one-to-one -one fashion, each law states one power, or each law states the relationship between two powers, or how powers combine together, or something like that. But the laws describe the powers directly and aren't uh, imposed on the material world. Um, and I have other examples that Ott goes through, uh, but there are several people in the modern period who hold these sort of causal powers view at the same time there's all this governing law talk. And we have this alternate reading of the legal metaphor. Um, but what do these, uh, how do these non-governing laws get their sort of metaphysical relevance? Um, here's what I at least call a dynamic second view of laws, which is the governing view. So on the governing view, where do the laws get their metaphysical relevance from? And I mean the laws that appear in our theories now. So there are laws of nature on this view, and those play a crucial metaphysical role in facilitating the dynamical behavior of matter. It's the laws themselves that get in and get involved in causing the matter to do things because the matter itself can't do anything. We then, as people, come onto the scene and study and codify those dynamics, and we build theories. And those theories feature laws. Right? Everyone's going to agree about that. 
Um, and those are at least approximations of the fundamental laws that did the governing on these sorts of governing views. But the theories are, the, are laws, are theories laws, get their metaphysical relevance from that pre-dynamical role that they had in facilitating dynamics or being an approximation thereof. That's where we're sort of getting their metaphysical heft from. Um, and so here we think of laws that legislate from on high and which must be in place before the game can even get started. Right? The laws neither the laws must either execute themselves or they have to be carried out by God. But there's no causal powers in the world to make the laws happen. They have to be the laws executing the world or a sort of governing God. Okay, so that's where they get their uh, metaphysical relevance and weight on the dynamics. Second view, which is the governing view, but there's this other way to put the metaphysical weight pre or post dynamics. We put dynamics first, and then the laws show up on the scene. So on this sort of view, the laws, the dynamical behavior of matter, happens on its own without any outside influence or, or control. And then we show up on the scene, same as before, and we study and codify that dynamics into theories, and those theories feature laws. So while there weren't any laws making the dynamical behavior happen, they do show up in our theories later on. And so the laws that appear in our theories have to get their metaphysical relevance uh, post-dynamics. The metaphysical heft comes from them being particularly nice ways of codifying some pre-existing dynamical behavior of matter. So they may latch on to some powers, describe individual powers, or do this, but they are more describing what's going on rather than controlling it. Um, so in a sort of legal societal metaphor, think of some aliens who show up late and observe some civilization and create a common law which codifies the long-standing practices of some pre-existing society of people. Show up, they start noticing, oh, when this person goes into this room, everybody bows down. Yeah. You know, um, you, st you start looking at the practices of the people. Uh, but nothing new is legislated. These are just sort of observers, right? And nothing's enforced. Before and after we codify the behavior of this society, the society operates according to its own local powers and principles. So nothing's being pushed on it. It's just sort of a summary, a codification into a sort of common law as viewed from outside. That's the view of laws that we are um, putting on the second view. And so does that save the legal metaphor? Or does this feel off somehow? So this is roughly what I think the other, the Bacon and Spinoza have in mind with their um, understanding of the legal metaphor. So, I mean, is this helpful? Does this uh, clarify what governing versus causal powers are a little bit? Well, so I'm more or less uh, familiar with uh, such, uh, such examples, and I think they don't work, but uh, I mean, so we can talk about it later. Okay. okay. Right. Uh, so, any other thoughts on this, this like, legal metaphor? If this completely undercuts the law of nature notion? as Descartes was sort of introducing it, or is there anything still salvageable about this legal metaphor that we need to hold on to? Definitely helpful for us in describing what's going on. Does that justify the legal metaphor and some of the intuitions that come along with it? I'm not sure. Um, I'll leave you all to think about that. Okay, but what are these causal powers? Um, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. Causal powers, broadly, they're any properties which bodies have within themselves, not directed from outside, which brings about necessary connections or necessary, which brings about necessity in the world pretty generally. Um, so governing views reject this. Descartes did. He thinks that the bodies by themselves are passive and inert. Armstrong thinks this too. Remember, we saw that uh, tofu could open locks if the laws said it could. Um, so that nothing about the tofu, its own nature, its own properties, is going into those actions. Uh, all these themselves, really, properties of them are only there to be the things which the laws move around. Um, so it's the laws themselves that bring about the necessary connections there. On the Humean view, simply rejects, that, suggests, re, simply rejects that there are necessary connections between distinct existences. Or at least that we can know about those. Um, there's two readings of Hume we'll talk about in the next lecture. But clearly, when we look around at the world, there are necessary connections all over the place. When I, uh, an apple falls, we, we put fire and paper together, they burn. If a vase is fragile, then that means that when you hit it, it will break. 
There seems to be these necessary sort of, if this happens, this necessarily happens, not by a matter of logic, but by a matter of like metaphysical necessitation that something happens and this causes something else to happen. And so the worry or the, the, the motivation for believing in causal powers, let's say, is how could a world which seemingly, okay, well, granted it's seeming at our level, uh, exhibits all these causal powers at the macroscopic level, so things push each other around, but how could that how could that be the case if there's no causal powers at the fundamental level? How could there be necessitation and if this if the apple moves it causes this to happen? How could all that happen if there's no causation really at the fundamental level? And surely these macro events that we're talking about and that we're familiar with are forced to happen because there are causal powers inherent in microscopic bodies. The electrons repel each other, and we have some fundamental physics story about how different particles must necessarily influence each other, and somehow from that all of this happens. Right? I think that's a very common intuition, uh, that we have to have these causal powers down at the bottom. Um, and so the question is, do we need these causal powers in the fundamental level to explain the world that we see around us? Now recall from lecture number two that we, Humean laws which recall just point out regularities and sort of name them. There's some big pattern in the world. We name it. We don't say that there's a causal power that makes it happen. We've just sort of found the pattern and named it, which seems very epistemologically safe. I mean, we do see patterns and we don't. It's a bit hard to see what's going on behind the scenes. But they say, don't worry, uh, the local pattern you've noticed is part of a much, much bigger pattern. That sort of explanation by unification. We've taken all the various phenomena of the world and we've accounted for them in one big pattern that we've noticed, but we might want appealing to the laws to carry more explanatory force than that. And you can get that explanatory force if you have the laws be summaries of the world's causal powers. They say this body has this causal power, these two causal powers relate to each other in this way, and I mean, if you really have the laws latching onto these causal powers, rather than just describing fixed states of the world. Um, and indeed, this does seem necessary. Here's a, here's a, at least seems necessary, here's a nice sentence from Ott. A punitive explanation of an event that bottoms out in non-powers is no explanation at all. It, all the oomph has gone missing. I wanted to know why this was necessary, why this necessarily caused this, and you told me it all bottoms out in non-powers. Where's, how's that explained anything? In the sort of causal sense, I wanted my explanation to follow. Okay, so does causal explanation require causal powers. Here's a uh, quote from Ellis about this. So Ellis argues that causal explanation cannot be carried out entirely in non-causal terms. Non-causal terms can enter into it. Maybe where the causal power is exercised depends on where bodies are. And that's not a causal power, a location or a shape. But those locations and shapes and distributions of things, while not causal in themselves, all the causation were to happen. Right, so the burden of explanation would never be discharged if we tried to explain everything in non-causal terms. Whenever a causal power, and in context he's talking about fragility at this point, is seen to depend on other properties, these other properties must always include causal powers, or the causal power of things cannot be explained except with reference to things that themselves have causal powers. So structures are not causal powers, meaning like the way things are arranged in shape, roughly. So no causal powers can be explained just by reference to such structures. For example, the existence of planes in a crystal structure does not, does not by itself explain the crystal's brittleness. Right? Unless there are cleavage planes, regions of structural weakness along which the crystal is disposed to crack. So when you want to explain the brittleness of a certain type of ceramic material, you would point to physical qualities of it. There's these atoms arranged in this way and these atoms arranged in this way, but then you can't just point to the structure of the thing to explain why it's fragile or why it would break if it's hit. Um, you need to have some sort of causal mechanism in there that if this thing came in, then what would necessarily cause the structure to change in this way that, such that it all fell apart? Okay, so causal explanation maybe seems to require that we appeal to causal powers. Um, but against this argument, uh, Akravardi has noted that this doesn't actually show that we need fundamental causal powers out there in the world. It just shows that we need causal talk. We were worried about an explanation going awry. We didn't, weren't able to appeal to causal powers. 
And so, okay, fine, we just have to justify talk of causation without justifying there being real causal powers in the world. And an analogy you might make here is in moral discourse requiring moral talk. But does that mean that there are irreducible moral properties out there in the world? It doesn't seem that just because we are required to talk in a certain way to do a certain kind of discourse, that the metaphysical structure of the world is such that there are things corresponding to what we talk about. That doesn't seem to follow at all. A viable counter strategy in the moral case and in the causal case is to offer an error theory for moral talk. So we don't, we, and any, any uh, approach to these problems will have to do this. People do all this causal talk all the time. You have to explain the success of that kind of talk, but the goal is to explain away that kind of talking without justifying the sort of posits uh, that it seems to be making directly. So we would need an error theory. And uh, a Humean can try and do this. They can try and account for causal or dispositional talk, justifying that talk in practice somehow without committing themselves to the existence of causal powers. And we'll talk about that strategy much more in the next lecture. Uh, and we saw the governing view was able to do this as well. It sort of was able to license talk about dispositions without granting the bodies themselves causal powers. We had the enchanted tofu opening the lock. Right? So there's alternate explanations where you can justify this talk of causation without committing to the fundamental ontology. Um, and so at least for these kinds of explanations that Ellis gave, which were in terms of explanations um, and, and just discourse, it only seems to have a sort of discursive um, implications. Okay, here's another uh, argument in favor of causal powers by Ellis. So science is all about dispositions, he says. Um, there are no known laws of nature that are concerned with the shapes or sizes of things. But if Descartes wanted to reduce everything to the shapes and sizes, arrangements and motions of bodies, all viewed in a causally inert way, um, and it's God that's moving things around, ultimately. But there are no laws that talk about things in those terms. When we talk about laws, and some laws do mention things like molecular structures, that like benzene rings are stable, something like that in chemistry. But those are dependent on the dispositional properties of the structure's parts. The reason that the benzene ring is stable Stability is a dispositional property, after all. It's, um, it means that if you disturb the system, it won't change. But why, what causal mechanisms uh, account for that? Here's some more from Ellis. Um, the most fundamental things that we know about all have causal powers or other dispositional properties. And as far as we know, they only have such powers. Of course, it could be that they have structures that we don't know about, which are somehow responsible for their dispositional properties but there's nothing to suggest that it might be so. It's very hard to see how such an argument might work. Just because a certain thing's structured in a certain way, which is a sort of categorical, non-modal property, um, why does it follow from that that certain things must happen? It seems difficult to cross that gap, as Ellis is saying. Um, and there's even less reason to believe that causal powers or propensities of the most basic things in nature are ontologically dependent on these supposed underlying structures. So it's just hard to see where the causal oomph would come from if um, we're trying to explain away these things. But this is, again, claiming that we need such causal oomph. If we have an error theory and we can explain all of that away, there's none of that to begin with. Um, and against this uh, argument from Ellis, here is uh, Frank Jackson. By the very nature of fundamental uh, physics, it can't find any non-dispositional properties, even if they are there. So there's sort of a lack in the scientific uh, investigation strategy that we're applying here. So when physicists tell us about properties, they take to be fundamental. They tell us about what these properties do. The electrons repel each other, the certain particles interact in some such a way. Right? But it's all about how the one thing influences the other thing, um, necessarily. Whenever these two things come in, they... So law talk is very much this causal powers talk in the way that scientists employ it. So we know what things are like essentially through the way that they impinge on us and our measurement instruments. But it does not follow from this that the fundamental properties of current physics or a completed physics are causal. That's just a result of our strategy for investigating and interacting with the world. So again, we can't seem to get from here to a claim about fundamental metaphysics, as suggesting as it might seem. Okay. Um, 
Lastly, I'll now uh, consider some arguments against causal powers, or at least pointing to the parts of them which are mysterious. Um, we have some fire, and it meets some paper, and under certain conditions, there's necessarily burning, which follows from this. But how many powers are present in this event? Let's take a tally, let's account for them. We've got the fire has the power to burn, things like paper, right? Uh, paper has the power to be burned. There's also a receptive capacity to um, allow it to be necessitated in a certain way. Stones don't have that power to be burned. We have active and passive powers. Um, and oxygen is there as well, and it has to play its role in allowing for the burning. Right? And now, I'm talking about fire and paper and oxygen. This would all be fundamental bodies, electrons and photons and things, but let's just get our intuitions going. And if you keep expanding what has to be there in order for any sort of event to take place, there's a tremendous number of conditional factors. There has to not be a tsunami coming in at the same time. There has to not be a million different things happening. Uh, so we have this indefinite number of bodies that have an indefinite number of competing and cooperating powers all interacting to make everything happen. And this is the problem we originally found with Aristotle. And this is why sort of Aristotelian laws viewpoint couldn't get to nice simple laws of inertia because they were just mired in this overwhelming number of competing and cooperating powers they couldn't characterize except by qualitatively. Okay, now really the powers would be realized at a more fundamental level. Like I just said, electrons repel each other and interact in certain ways with photons, etc. But the question sort of remains, we've got this big network of causal powers. How does it all fit together? Why does it all fit together? Um, my, you might think that's a, a sort of um, incoherent question. One might think, of course, that the, the world's powers all fit together. The world is a sort of unity in a way, and it'd be incoherent if the powers didn't fit together. So the following situation literally has a notion of incoherence to it. The fire has the power to burn paper, but paper has the power to turn into a chicken when touched by flame. That's Ott's example. So why do the powers have to line up at all? The fire points to the paper and says, you burn, and the fire, paper points to the fire and says, I'm, you're capable of burning me. Why do those have to line up? Right? It seems incoherent if they wouldn't line up, and we'd like maybe the coherence of powers to be necessary, but necessary in what sense and by virtue of what? It's not clear that this is a case of logical incoherence. If we had a crazy world where the powers triggered each other in off funny ways and they didn't cohere very well at all, it seems like that's not a logical incoherence. At least some people think that that sort of world could exist logically, but there's no logical contradiction within it. Um, but by virtue of what do the powers sort of cohere so well? And this seems especially mysterious if we want the causal powers to be sort of housed within each body individually. If the causal powers are rooted in the intrinsic natures of the things, it's in the intrinsic nature of electrons that they repel each other and that they interact with photons in this such a way. But if it's in the intrinsic nature of an individual body, how does that individual body know about the other bodies, what their powers are, how they should latch up to each other? Uh, that's very, very mysterious. Uh, so here's Williams on this, and it leads him to a sort of powers holism. Setting aside what makes the powers fit together, what, what makes it necessary that they fit together, it seems mysterious that they even can fit together in the first place without knowing about each other. Again, this is, the, this is sort of the little soul's argument from, from Descartes. How does the rock know where the center of the earth is so it can move there? Every body seems to need to know about the powers of all the other bodies in order to do this. And that's a lot for a, a little soul to know. So in order to provide uh, the fit of powers, um, we must set up the powers in a way such that they always match. So how can this be done? One way is to cram all of the information about every other property into the power, thereby building powers according to a plan. A plan that includes what kind of manifestations would result from each and every set of reciprocal partners. So we have to know that when these two things come together, they do this sort of thing. Imagine any sort of like, I don't know if you guys ever played like Yu-Gi-Oh or Magic the Gathering. There's all these different cards and they have these powers and they describe, but how do all the different cards interact with each other? It's like there's this big swamp of rules and cases and it's very complicated how that uh, gets on. But we're trying to have the bodies themselves do all that organization. We don't want a law set that tells all the bodies how to interact from outside. We want the bodies to know naturally how to interact with each other. 
in every possible situation. So each property contains within it a blueprint for the entire universe. Um, so according to Williams, we're forced into a sort of holism about power. But the powers don't so much stand individually. They only make sense as a coherent network, a big interconnected web. And to make an analogy with another part of philosophy, compare this with a sort of semantic holism, that the meanings of individual words don't stand on their own. The only way meanings, words have their definite meanings is in the context of the meanings of all the other words. Right? And so the, but then this sort of globalizes the meaning structure, and it's hard to see how we can get a handle on it. Uh, um, so the people have some problems with the semantic holism, and those may or may not transfer over to the powers holism, but it's a... Uh, Interesting sort of comparison. Okay, but now let's admit that there's this holistic network of powers which somehow have to know about each other in a way to, um, to cohere so well. What makes it necessary that they cohere so well? So we need this structure, this holistic structure to make them cohere, but what makes that structure be there? And again, this is very mysterious if we give, if each given body's powers is rooted in the intrinsic nature of that body, how is it supposed to know about all of this wider world that it's supposed to be uh, participating in. So maybe we should deny that the powers are intrinsic uh, to each body. They may depend on the relationships between bodies. So we don't have, earlier when I was counting up the powers, I counted the power of fire to burn paper separately from the power of paper to be burned. I counted those as two separate properties and now we're wondering about how those line up, how those fit together. Maybe we don't have to do that. Maybe it's only because we've sort of artificially separated out the powers. You have your power, you have your power, and then, but then how do they fit together? You shouldn't have separated them in the first place. Maybe this is what makes us so puzzled about how they can cohere with each other. Perhaps it's only in the combinations that the bodies have powers. We want to say when it, the power is not of the fire to burn, of the paper to do this, it's a combined power that they have when they get together. But this also leads us to some, some mysteries. Um, right. Let's say that in the, it's not in the intrinsic, it's not the intrinsic nature of the key that gives us the power of opening when it meets a lock. And it's not in the, in the intrinsic power of the lock. Nothing about that makes anything necessary. It's somehow the combined natures of the key and the lock give us this power that they have for opening each other. But, it's a bit confusing. Where does the causal force enter into this picture if it doesn't enter in via either of the other bodies? But the causal force that's necessitating that the key meets the lock and there's an opening, right? Um, it can't be based in the key since the, we agreed the key has no causal power on its own. Trying to get the causal powers to exist in the relationships between bodies, not in the individual bodies. So the key's not bringing anything to the table itself. And neither is the lock. Um, but it can't be based in the non-causal powers or the non-causal relationships between the key and the law. We just seem to have uh, the corresponding shapes there, and those can't explain much. It doesn't seem like it's clear where this causal oomph comes from. If it's not the key bringing the, or the lock bringing it, or them somehow doing it together. Maybe there's ways to move forward in this direction. And people are debating about it, as you can tell. Um, let's, let's wrap up with... Uh, some discussion of Hume, because we'll get on to Hume next week. Uh, this all seems extremely speculative about what the fundamental metaphysics of causation is. And Hume seems to agree about this and thinks we should probably move away from that. Acqu according to Hume, all of our ideas come from experience. He's a very radical empiricist in this way. And we never see causation out there in the world. When we look at billiard balls bouncing off of each other, we see the one moving and the other moving, and then we see them change direction. And we see that over and over. We just see a constant conjunction of events playing out in the world. We see somebody striking a match and then there being fire. We don't see the striking of the match causing the fire. We just see the event and then the other event. We just sort of see all these things in conjunction. Here's Hume's quote about it. Our ideas, therefore, of necessity and causation arise entirely from the uniformity observable in the operations of nature, where similar objects are constantly conjoined together, and the mind is determined by custom to infer from the one the appearance of the other. So these two circumstances form the whole of that necessity which we ascribe to matter. Beyond the constant conjunction of similar objects, 
the consequent interference, inference from one to the other, we have no notion of any necessity or connection. So our idea of causation, at least, comes from an experiential base of seeing things constantly conjoined together. That's where the idea comes from. Um, and so according to Hume, and we'll talk a lot more about Hume next week, um, causation, at least insofar as we can know about it, is merely a custom or habit that we have for linking causes with effects. So at least that's our empirical grasp of it. Um, and Hume is against doing sort of speculative metaphysics, where we sort of try and figure out what the world's like in itself, going beyond our experience. We shouldn't speculate. Hence, whether or not there is causation in the world. And there's two readings of Hume. Uh, one where he's very critical about the existence of causation actually out there in the world, and that's a sort of metaphysical reading that has metaphysical implications. There's another reading we'll talk about where it's just an epistemic problem, that we can't have access to these things and we shouldn't speculate beyond what we have access to. Um, okay, whether or not there is causation out there in the world, the responsible thing for us to do as metaphysicians is to work as if there isn't, work as if all that causation is is a habit that we have for linking causes with effects. That's a very safe, non-speculative way to go forward with metaphysics. And he thinks we can still do good metaphysics in this way without making any unfounded speculations. All we ever see are regularities out there. Therefore, we can and should, for reasons of epistemic modesty, treat causation and laws of nature as if they're simply efficient summaries of the world's patterns. We don't need to, and we should be able to do all of the work that way. At least any metaphysical work that we're putting causation or the laws of nature to in like grounding counterfactuals or different things like this, if we're to have any sort of epistemic warrant for doing that, it better be based on experience, says Hume, and experience can only get us so far in studying causation. So we should be able to do all the work that we uh, want to do without that. But we'll talk more about Hume uh, later. And so here are some uh, references for the, the talk today. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. How do people feel about causal powers? Yeah. Um, so for the holism claim, yeah. um, I, I just wondering what count as not fitting together? Like uh, what count as uh, powering, but uh, the powers are not fitting together. Yeah. For example, if, if the plane has the power to burn and then the paper has the power to turn to a chicken, like I don't see what's wrong with it. It's just different from our current. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe if we, if there was some world that had the powers not fitting together so well, we'd be used to it. And so we think it's natural and we think that the world is built according to some other principles. And so maybe we're just creating scenarios and saying that would be very strange. But if we lived in that world, it wouldn't be so strange. Um, so there's maybe a bit of um, perspective built into these judgments about what's uh, nice and what's poor, but there may be some sort of, um, like the, the standard model of particle physics fits on a t-shirt, you know? You can imagine worlds where it's like, there's 12,000 kinds of particles and each one has its own little exceptions about how it fits into the system. And there really is no way to uniformize and systematize the whole thing. Like when you, when you really do science and physics, you, you do see that things are fitting together in a really, pretty special way. There's a few things that are odd and don't make quite sense, but we feel like those can be resolved and put into the package. So we have a sort of intuition that things ought to come out simple and not have sort of bits stuck on all over the place. And, um, maybe this is just us trying to drive towards something simple and we won't stop until it is simple. And we're very smart so we can figure out a way to simplify everything. But, but who knows? Yes. So uh, here's a case. I wonder how we shall analyze it. So suppose we we live in a Euclidean state. <laughs> now it's probably incorrect, but let's suppose so nonetheless. And uh, we uh, we have a habit of measuring the angles of triangles. So we have a measuring tool, and there is a regularity. Each time we measure the angles of the triangle we draw on the board, we get something uh, very, very, very close to 180 degrees. Yeah. Uh, if we're realistic, it won't be exactly 180 degrees because we're not uh, totally accurate in our drawing, 
but we're always getting something in the vicinity of 180 degrees. Yeah. Now, according to each of the uh, conceptions of law or, or, or the views of laws mm -hmm. that uh, that you presented. Yeah. What, what is going on here? Is there a causal power in play? Is there a law governing something? Um, is there a primitive law here, or what, how, yeah. how will you analyze that? Yeah. Um, the example might not be the best to demonstrate the difference between these views, um, because this summing to 180 is a sort of mathematical and logical fact. So the necessity of that maybe is coming from a logical necessity. I assume, well, if it's logically necessary that we're in a Euclidean space, maybe you are or aren't accepting this. Um, but from the Humean view, uh, let's say, there would just be a bunch of constant conjunctions of people setting out with, um, with rulers and measuring devices and coming back with results of these things. So it's just a bunch of constant conjunctions of shapes and arrangements of things. We'll talk next week about David Lewis, who has a sort of Humean mosaic. There's just a distrib distribution of categorical properties out there in the world, and those include, for Lewis, geometric facts. Um, so there would just be triangles out there with these structures, and the people come up, and these atoms become adjacent to these atoms, and then they become far apart. And it's just completely in descriptive, non-modal terms that you would describe the measurement process of the people coming, measuring, checking, celebrating, right? So in a Humean view, it's all just um, conjunctions of events which have no causal powers or modal thickness at whatsoever. That's how the, the Humean would talk about it. Now, the causal powers view would roughly say that um, our measurement devices are built out of atoms and those atoms have the causal powers which are, go into creating the rigidity of the ruler. And it's the rigidity of the ruler which goes in and maintains its length across distances. The reason bodies, for Hume, the reason the ruler would keep its size as it moves across the room is just that it does. There's a regularity in which rulers move across the room and keep their size. So there's no causal explanation for it. But on the causal powers view, it would be the nature of the bodies which are re regarding that um, regularity of uh, rigidity, sorry. Um, and then there would be a that those causal powers would go in to provide a causal mechanism for that same story that the Humean was telling us. So they would tell the same story about the people bringing the atoms near the other atoms and celebrating afterwards. Um, but they would do it all with a causal mechanism behind the scenes doing that. And the governing view would say of this, the bodies are inert, passive things with no causal powers in themselves, and it's God who has his hands on all the billiard balls and makes them move around as such, and then makes the people celebrate. Although on the, causal, on the governing view, uh, oftentimes there's an exception made for human souls and things, um, that God doesn't have his hands on our souls making us move around. We have some agency ourselves. So, so how people fit into the governing view is a bit funny sometimes, but, but I hope that's clear how the three camps would describe that situation. Maybe on the governing view, it'd be better to describe it in terms of Armstrong. So we have all the particulars and universals out there, but those do no metaphysical work in causing events to happen. There just happen to be some second order universals contingently there, which relate the universals and thereby make them, the associations between them necessary. So they would all explain things in a sort of Humean way. Just the other two views want some causal backing to that, and they locate the causal backing in different places. Okay, any other? Well, great. Uh, thank you all for coming, and we'll do Hume in the last week.